Please welcome my guest, Stephen Leonard from Blackberry. Yep. Jeff Hollingworth from Ericsson. Wow. Did I hear some booing? Wow. There's a tough audience. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And Matt Cohen from Xerox, representing Mopria. All right. We have a mic check. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, great. So, gentlemen, I, provide, I promised you drinks. You have your drinks right here. I promised them. And okay, so we're going to start by allowing you selves to introduce yourself one minute each, and then we'll go to our questions in the open conversation. All right? Go. Steve Leonard. I'm a senior uh, enterprise solutions manager uh, in the industry. That would be more like a solutions architect. Uh, but they don't like the word uh, architect in most cases in our HR department. Uh, I work with enterprise customers around their applications and so custom solutions. So if you have a set of requirements and you go, hey, I need to bring this to BlackBerry 10 or I need to bring it to iOS, Android, how do you land up going about that? Excellent. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Hollingworth from Ericsson. Uh, I'm actually a software developer, but they don't let me do that very much. Uh, the, I uh, here with Ericsson, and, and what we're looking at is, uh, obviously the world is, is going on to cloud infrastructure. The question is, how do we get there faster without compromising any of the safety and trust issues that, that exist around the world and with the uh, big companies? Great, Matt. Hi, Matt Cohen. I'm a uh, global development manager at Xerox, and that's, that's actually my day job. I manage a product development team for digital alternatives, which is, you know, enterprise development developed for our enterprise customers. And uh, I'm here to represent Mopria. So, and that's a, a mobile print alliance, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Cool. So most people have already heard of BlackBerry and Ericsson. So you, you, you set it up perfectly. So why don't you talk to us about what is Mopria? Why are they here, or you here, and sort of how, how we've you know, kind of talked about this last night, the transformative nature of what it's going to do to folks in this room and around the world as they contemplate workflows and development? Sure. I mean, it won't pre um, but Well, first of all, what does it stand for? Yeah, Mobile Print Alliance. So uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was formed by HP, Canon, uh, Xerox, um, and Samsung. And it's grown to over 20 uh, different, uh, mo all, the, all the major manufacturing, uh, print manufacturers have signed up. And at this point, we've got about 100 million, um, nearing 100 million devices in the field that are Mopria certified. Um, we've established, you know, we work with the, within the alliance, we work together. So we, uh, each company volunteers their own expertise, so we, you know, nobody knows printing like the people building the actual printers. So the print manufacturers are all agreed to standards, and we, our, our mission is to make print easy. So it's a question I have to all of you. You know, when, when do you encounter friction in, in, in that experience of printing? It needs to be easy. It is the cheapest UI, uh, pa paper, that is, is the cheapest UI. And um, from our mission is really, it, it we started and we released a um, Android print service called the Mopria print service, which is the equivalent of a um, universal print driver for Android. Uh, we took care of all of the hard work. We, you know, you, you install it uh, if it's not already preloaded on your device, which we're working on. And from there, it, it discovers the printers available in the, in the network around you and allows you to just quickly print. It's just a three-step three step process. It's very simple. Um, so I think we've, we've solved that problem in Android. We're starting to look at the rest of the ecosystem, identifying places where there are, where there are friction and, and trying to queue up you know, future work. So where can folks find more information? So mopria.org. One, one of the parallels is also is um, Mopria is a, a global non-for-profit alliance you know, with, with all these co um, companies, the print manufacturers. So it's, I see a lot of synergy with the Application Developer Alliance just from that perspective and the, the, the intent of what we were trying to solve. So 
I think it, cool. it helps it helps you all provide more value to the applications you develop and that we take the print problem and try to make it as easy as possible. And I can confirm. So last night he tells me this, and I didn't believe him. And I went to the Google Play Store, and I downloaded it. And next thing you know, I was able to print all sorts of stuff to the Starbucks right next door. That was amazing, literally. If you have not seen the demo, you should go see this. It truly is transformative. And if you're doing enterprise development, you're going to want to figure out how this works in your workflow. So it's pretty neat. OK, cool. So. We have some infrastructure services. We've learned all day today. In fact, it was a fantastic chart from TLAC. They've showed all the different interactions that have to happen to a developer. I noticed that what was not on there was our CIO, our security, and some of the other conversations that you know I've had. So if you can share, we had this good, we had a good comment. You guys can all chime in, but I'm going to start with Steve. Share with the group what, if I'm, a, if I'm moving into enterprise development for the first time, we talked about this yesterday, people process and, and, and uh, paperwork, right? It, it's at a large scale. It can be daunting. Who do I want to start aligning myself with? Who do I need to go seek out as I begin to contemplate building in the enterprise, whether I'm joining the company or coming to the company as a contractor or a third-party outsource house? Who, who do I go to? How do I, what should I start looking for? Well, first off, it actually depends on where you're coming into. In most cases right now, uh, in enterprise mobility, because of the dependency on uh, like a Macintosh, if you're building for iOS, you're targeting iOS, uh, most IT organizations aren't prepared to manage the Apple devices. So it's usually by exception. So you end up with having a lot of enterprise mobility application developers going into a center of excellence. Historically, the center of excellence, though, doesn't isn't a build center of excellence. But because of the fact that you now have to have iOS and BlackBerry and Android developers and everything all in one area to target everything, you've ended up having a lot of companies that have gone, okay, we're going to put a special group together and it's going to be separate from the business and the line of business groups. And they're going to be focused on both B2C as well as B2B. So what you end up with is the enterprise, develop enterprise groups, right? So a line of business going, I want to build an application. They're going to their line of business developers who then, in a lot of cases, you might be coming into that situation. You run into the fact of, oh, I want to build a mobile application. And then you find out, well, I can't because I need to target everything. So now you actually have to go partner with that center of excellence. So that's one challenge for coming in as a mobile developer in a lot of enterprises. If you're coming into that center of excellence, though, one of the key items is you need to find your mobile people, right? The people that are doing the mobile infrastructure that are handling the deployment of applications, the standards, your architecture, your security. So in a lot of cases, you hopefully your organization in the center of excellence has already figured out who those contacts are, right? How do I create my application? What standards do I have? Single sign-on, where's my hosting? How does, how does things get routed? Am I, and you're from a, if you're a regulated industry, what your compliance rules are, right? Everyone's, uh, pretty much most of the clients I have, almost none of them have the same infrastructure. Whether it's, they have different MDMs, some put their web services outside their firewall, they go, nope, no enterprise apps are allowed in, everything's outside. Then you run into the fact that you have to do penetration testing all the time. Others do all this trickery in their DMZ based on certain solutions. Where BlackBerry, historically with um, BES 5, as well as BES 12, 10 and BES 12, we actually land up having, as Ed had mentioned, uh, the connection, the connectivity goes outside of your firewall. You don't have to worry about punching holes in it. So what that allows you to think about is, I wrote an application as an app dev. I deployed it. I don't need to worry about all those details because my app acts as if it's on the intranet. Um, so, but everybody doesn't have Bez. Everybody has different scenarios. So you want to find that enterprise group that's actually already dealing with the center of excellence. OK, so really quickly, how many here in the audience, we, we kind of agreed to this question, how many here believe that their company has a center of excellence that they could go to in the support of building, whether it's mobile applications or just general applications for the enterprise? And if you're embarrassed to raise your hand, kind of just shake your head, and I'll take a look at the scan. Is there anybody? When you talk to the CIOs, they'll all say, absolutely. I know they do, but now I'm asking the guys and the girls in the room who are actually developing, and no one's raising their hands. Well, I know you do. Yeah, but you're a startup. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. No, I, I, 
you're you're right. If, if sorry, that's that that's that was an unfair comment. That's an unfair comment. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's a really accurate comment, though, because well, uh, he is a startup. That's a, that is an yeah, accurate yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, so he has accurate. a startup. So yeah. <laughs> but the the interesting insight there is that and, and you this was coming from your conversation actually till like this morning. The one thing that big companies and startups all have in common now is we all have to build really good software products. How do you build really good software products? Well, an enterprise IT organization is not geared to build really good software products. The last people they speak to are the people that use it, right? <laughs> uh, so, so one piece of advice, if you're a developer looking to join an enterprise, is, is to find an enterprise that's embraced the fact they want to build really good software products, which is what I picked up from your presentation this morning, Tillich, that, that that's adopting the best practice of the developer community outside of governed IT and then bringing it in. So. Jake actually uh, commented, that might be a question to ask in the developer survey. It would be a cool sort of, you know, what do you have in terms of center of excellence, if, or if you do or not, because that, that would be an interesting. Kiak, go on, go ahead, make that comment. Yeah, one of the interesting parts is because we do end up into the thing, it's best practice is that center of excellence, and we actually find that companies go, oh, we have this, and you find out that there's a group of people. In a lot of cases, they're B2C. One of the things that I had found when I started talking to customers a lot about this was they can't get, their business people are coming, I want to have this great idea for a business app, and by the time they navigate everything, their feature scope is now down to so little because they don't have enough budget for it that they just cancel it. And what I landed up coming out from that was, okay, well, what are you trying to get? Problem is, is most enterprises are now building mobile, or they're building web, right? Most of their internal apps are web applications. So historically, coming from the BlackBerry side, right, where your application's always on the intranet, one of the things that I actually have the conversation is, okay, have you actually looked at potentially doing responsive web? Because a lot of mobile applications for the enterprise don't, do, don't go outside of location services and they don't, go, they don't do anything beyond location for sensors. So in that case, you can get away with HTML5 as a web type, mobile web, responsive web, that type of thing, by living in the browser. That's a real cheap way to get if you're a small part of the a business that has maybe $50,000. Depending on the scale of your company, you know what I mean. Real quickly, money uh, runs out on the projects. In a lot of cases, the overhead is doing custom stuff. It's getting engineering architecture involved. So can you add a single page, a responsive page, to an existing application? Right? It's a mobile view in an MVC type environment. It's a mobile view of that application. In most cases, the developers who are tied to your line of business go, hey, I already do web. Yes, absolutely. They'll be really excited to go do it for 25,000. And you can get it in there. Once you get that type of application in there, now the business has the taste for it. Now you can come back and go, you know what, next year, why don't we put a little bit more in there and let's see if we can get you an offline app. Maybe we can give additional features. But it's a lot easier to do a little improvement than to try to go s from square one and get caught up in all our enterprise processes. All right, so, Jeff. You have an Are you remembering last night now? I'm, 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 I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> yes, um, no, I'm having flashbacks. Um, you have a great quote, which I'm gonna let you share with the audience. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a reminder, email, bottom line quote. Yeah, cloud, yeah. Um, like you to share that with the audience. I, it's interesting, as I was talking to people throughout the course of the, the day, I, I actually miss, I, I had a misbelief that people actually knew who Ericsson was. There's a lot of people who don't actually know who Ericsson is. So could you give a, maybe a minute or two, or give some of the highlight stats that you and I have been talking about, you know, depth, breadth, software style, et cetera. Tie that back to the quote you're making, and then I'm gonna have some questions about the role that we just saw with Intel now. So let, we'll start with that, and then I'll come back to you with a question. All right, let's, let's see how I do on this. Okay, so can, there you we go. Fill, you can fill the gaps in. Uh, who's used the mobile phone today? Hands up, who's used the mobile phone? Okay. Uh, hands up, who hasn't got a mobile phone? Okay. Who's got more than one mobile phone, just out of interest? Uh, who's got three mobile phones? Wow. <laughs> what, you're, now you're counting your, your private silence of the land's collection <laughs> mobile phone uh, <laughs> thing going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, You've all used Ericsson software today. So Ericsson actually is the fifth largest software company because Ericsson is the people that doesn't make the phones, 
we make the infrastructure that connects all of the phones. And we actually make that in uh, 187 countries, or we deploy that in 187 countries. A little bit of trivia is that the only country we don't do business in is North Korea. Uh, we're looking forward to a regime change in North <laughs> Korea. Uh, and when I say we do have a sales team waiting for that regime change and helping them to understand the upside of connectivity, I am not joking. Right? We are there. So um, you help fund the movie? Sorry? You help fund the movie? <laughs> So, so we'll get off that bit of history. Uh, the, uh, what we've really done, though, behind this is built a very industrialized infrastructure that has to work. Because actually what happens is now that our society depends on mobile phones working and working correctly. Uh, and what we see moving now is, is the connection of everything else. And that transformation is going to completely change what is normal and how we behave. That's going to require a complete, completely different approach to IT infrastructure. That's what we've been touching on today, by the way. Uh, and what we are doing at the moment is taking a step back and looking at what is the best practice to actually deploy digital infrastructure that you can trust and that is predictable. Because once you start to put things that you really care about on top of that infrastructure, it becomes really important to you. So. Uh, there are actually three industries that exist in the world. We, we s commonly speak about IT industry. That's familiar to us. Uh, telco industry is familiar. There is a third industry, and it's actually the hyperscale cloud industry. And they've had to cope with a completely different growth of in infrastructure requirement and application development. Because they were the first people that discovered the need to actually exponentially scale infrastructure and operation without exponentially scaling cost. So they threw away the traditional approach to IT, and they actually then realized they had to automate everything. So what we are doing, and it's in collaboration with Intel, and it's the infrastructure that we showed you today, is bringing really what Hyperscale does and bringing it out to everybody else, because that's the only way you'll cope with running a petabyte data business in the future. And that's what every single company in this room is going to become, a petabyte data-driven company. The ones that don't do that, by the way, won't be around. They just won't be able to compete. So Ericsson is really taking that industrialized software approach and adding, we did it for networking, and we're adding compute and storage to that. Uh, to do that, requires us to become really good at building software products, which is why we're really interested to be here, because we have the same need as a General Electric, as a American Express, as any other company, because we need to transform to being a software application company as well. And the quote? The quote is, uh, uh, are we late to cloud? We're late to cloud the same way that iPhone was late to, uh, sorry, yeah, Apple was late to phones. Right? I'm so tired of listening to people saying, well, what's the point? I mean, you know, this problem's already solved. Anyone who tells you that a problem's already solved has very little imagination in the world we're living in. Because five years from now, nothing that's solved today kind of like looks like the right solution. You, I was laughing at you, Urban. I mean, kind of, you was bringing, oh, imagine living in 1998. How, how backward was that? Kind of... Uh, this is as backward as it'll ever be today, right now. It's crap. So five years from now, the people who understand what's bad and what will get fixed uh, are going to be the winners. Actually, just a little anecdotal information for somebody. If, if, if anyone here heard of Beloit College in Wisconsin? So their uh, director of admissions and a sociology professor were trying to level set the teaching uh, staff to incoming students about 15 years ago. And so they wrote a missive, a missive saying, your students were born on or before this date, which means this. And then they listed these facts. It's like, for example, never seen a public payphone, have never seen an 8-track tape, blah, blah, blah. So they've been publishing this every year for the last 15 years. If you go to Beloit College and you look at it, it's called the anthology of what has happened. And when you start walking down memory lane, you're going to sit there and say, holy shit, 1998. I mean, go, it's amazing. 
it is un utterly believable. So yes, in five years' time, it's you know my my kids don't even know what a payphone is. They have no idea what the the actual turn like of the phone, the, the rotary dial. Yeah, they don't understand that. No, no, no. They think all phones are wireless. They don't, we don't have. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. My mother was just joking the other day. That's what she wants for Christmas. Who does? My mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a mobile phone? Well, that no on, on her home a phone. Mobile this phone. Way you work for BlackBerry, the, a company the... that makes mobile phones. <laughs> I'm no, sorry, on the, the, on the terrestrial <laughs> one. <laughs> All right, so now my follow-on question to you, Jeff. We heard some really cool things about what you and Ericsson, sorry, you and Intel in partnership are doing. We've heard about the need for stuff to be easy, and we've heard about some of the f structural and infrastructure needs that sort of BlackBerry and others have raised as we've talked about security. Can you talk about either A, vision, or B, desire, to embed more of this in sort of either Intel hardware or Ericsson switch product as you deploy this to the field such that developers could just literally show up and be able to say, hey, I know I'm targeting an HDS 8000, so that means all these constructs are in place and it's very, very simple or very easy. Yeah, so so there's, there's three layers actually we speak about that are kind of important. There's, uh, uh, we've covered a little bit the hardware and facility layer today. So how do you engineer a completely programmable facility and compute storage network infrastructure? That's really the API that we were looking at. And what you start to design is a computer that can be a kilometer wide, actually. That's what you were working on today. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat, then, repeat that for everybody? Yeah, so the concept of a computer has just got destroyed. The concept that we've had since the 1950s, or if you saw the uh, imitation game, the 1940s, uh, of a computer being a physical entity that has to be closely connected and closely spatially positioned hasn't changed for 50 years. What's happened is that miniaturizations happened and things, but still the basics are that you put components on a board next to each other and they work closely together. We're not going to do that in the future because really the architecture that uh, has come in and the real innovation is in optics with photonics is that you can distribute components over a, a wide area, a kilometer area. Why is that important? Because suddenly, you can on demand actually bring components in and make the computer as if you were building it at home. Remember when you used to build computers and you made it specialized for your gaming? That's exactly what you can do on demand on the fly with the API you just saw. So you can literally spin up a dedicated six petabyte kind of media server have that running for a couple of hours, spin it down, spin it up, have a high compute uh, computer off the same components, and all the time, all of that hardware and infrastructure is completely balanced in terms of utilization, because that's where you actually get the economics. You never throw anything away that you don't need to anymore. Today, we throw servers away, what, just because the CPU is kind of like not the latest CPU. No, no, no. None of the hyperscale people do that anymore. You just throw away the CPUs that are end of life and you double capacity according to Moore's law and you increase uh, utilization again. So, so that's all going on, right? The, the secret there is gonna be completely hiding the complexity of that from a design point of view. So what I would attest in the future is that you won't actually spin up a machine anymore. What you'll actually have is an application manifest and inside the application manifest, you'll put requirements in there. It'll say, I need a certain latency. I need a certain security level, a certain compliance. That application will get deployed on infrastructure, and it will actually get deployed according to the SLA that you know, is required. The other, the other revolution that's going on, of course, is that uh, IT is broken. IT, IT is dead, actually. Now, there was a great article this is a bit controversial, but I'm quoting articles, so that's okay. Uh, I, I you wrote the article too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, ghost name. Uh, but if you've noticed, IT companies are merging today like crazy. The EMC, the Dells, you know, I saw a great article in Fortune where it says, uh, you know, it's really funny when you put two bricks together and you expect them to float, right? <laughs> uh, all of the tech companies will have to reinvent themselves to actually take take care of this new world where you have to do 100 times more for about the same. You have to cope with that exponential growth. So the best practice starts to come around how do you automate infrastructure? How do you 
enable devs to go really, really quickly and you can still deploy to ops without exposing risk of policy, governance, security, right? When you've got 10,000 apps like General Electric, how do you make sure that the right people are actually speaking to the right things at any time and you are in control and you can show compl uh, compliance? So that platform level of the automation is, is another game changer. And obviously containers are, you know, going wild in that space and uh, uh, amazing industries are adopting containers. Uh, the, uh, the financial services industry, I think, is, is a great example. I mean, what a, what a you know, risk-adverse industry. And they, they are adopting technology now faster and faster. And you have to ask why, right? Why, why take that risk? Simple stat that I heard that blew me away was that 25% of millennials will change bank based on how good the mobile app is. So suddenly the new customer is changing bank just because the app feels better, right? And that's the new generation that's actually needing to be served. So companies have no choice, but, but balancing that speed versus risk, again, is gonna be an interesting paradigm to manage, right? So speaking of paradigm changes, you know, we have so much happening from these two gentlemen we've just talked about. But Matt, d we talked about so much last night in terms of the transformative effect that print will have. Speak a little bit, I mean, s if to the extent that you can pull back the data points. <laughs> Speak to the points. No, we talked about, you know, Impact of print on, on, on youth. We talked about our children. My kids don't print a lot, but that's because they're not used to printing. So how do we teach people to print, number one? We talked a little bit about that. Number two, how do we get folks in this room to understand that print is, in fact, something that's, that's really needed? In fact, your, your big banner out there, what, what was it, Charlie, 97% of most people want to be able to print at some point in time? So how do, how do we do that? I know what Mopri is doing, but how do we do that? And then more importantly, to the extent that you can, as we were looking at that whiteboard diagram, how does that integrate to some of the security and automation aspects that have been raised here? Good question. So uh, print is, you know, you, you read articles about print being dead, and it's definitely, you know, declined. Um, but the, the, the print, print is contextual. You, it needs to be easy, or people aren't going to do it. If you don't have to do it. Um, there's uh, tons of, of use cases from crafts and recipes to, to you know, scrapbooking and just printing out that picture you took. And, you know, you go to the office and, and you know, a, a lot of people um, develop applications which do what I call round tripping, right? You create a, a form and uh, OMR, o ICR, et cetera, extract all the data from it and populate a system very quick. It, it's fairly simple to code the... Algorithms for doing all that stuff are, are pretty much a commodity at this point. So it's it's making it easy. It's enabling it where it makes sense. You know, I, I, I would never print when you don't need to, but it does make sense in a lot of cases. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the operating system vendors, et cetera, haven't always made it easy. So um, that's, that's where Mopria steps in. The print companies come together, try to make it easy. And I think we're, we're catching up, and we're going to just continue to, to pave that road. Um, but in terms of security, it, um, print, you know, it, it only exists on that piece of paper if, it, the way we've integrated Mopria is it's direct printing. So we have Wi-Fi direct right now. Um, we have some enterprise features that are going to become available very soon, right, the, um, beginning of next year, um, is my understanding. The, um, but just it's local to that network, so it's pretty I as opposed to some cloud print and some other technologies. It's it's lower risk, you know, from that perspective. The the and when you have print, I mean, you can argue this in a number of different ways. But um, I if you do print out some things that are very important to you, I mean, there's pictures and all those types of things that they last. You know, there's memory preservation, all that other stuff. If you don't want somebody to uh, um, see something that's printed, just don't get it out, right? But you can't make those claims always with with data with bits on a on a draw. So, Steve, you you suddenly found out last night that we can suddenly enable anybody to print at any time anywhere in the world. 
talk about your reaction to that. <laughs> I, I'd actually. <laughs> <laughs> you can use the language you used last night. Well, the fact that it, he brought up the uh, Android uh, implementation hit right at home because I've been, uh, for those of you that are, are aware, we're kind of launching an, an Android device, in, adding it to the portfolio. Kind of? So I was just... Like it's announced, right? It's announced. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm not breaking the announcement. Um, but as a result, I had already been looking at, okay, well, how do I print to the things in my house? Um, so the key is... Uh, for coming from a financial services background, one of the things with cloud print, as you mentioned, is always the security concerns, right? Everything you install goes, oh, okay, pops up the dialogue. You know you're going to print it out on the internet. Okay, here, not, most people are going, okay, can I get my bills now sent to my house? Well, okay, I sent it to my house, or I, I, I get it to my email, and now I'm printing it. Where's it going on the way to my uh, printer? So this solves that problem right up front. And as you it hit on it, my my wife does scrapbooking and things like that. So relative to the print, the print is archival, right? You can print it out, you can put it in a folder, you can put it um, present it to people. Whether it's pictures, whether it's documents, um, you, it, it's going to be here in a hundred years. Might be yellow depending on the paper. I don't know if we've <laughs> solved all the acid issues, but if it's acid free, it'll hopefully be here in a hundred years. We have a few minutes left, so we're going to go to that most holiest religious question of all. You each get a chance to weigh in on it. HTML5 or native? Go. Well, since I had talked about doing enterprise and I've touched on both HTML5 and native, it really depends on the fu overall funding of the project. No. So, Answer. Which one? In most cases, HTML5 for the enterprise. All right. Jeff. I'd go native because at the end of the day, the experience, I, I was a huge believer in HTML5. It, it was like the answer to everything. And you were a big it. Cordova user, cross-platform across oh, yeah. the way. Yeah, it, was, it just made so much sense, but it's, it's never delivered. At the end of the day, it's got to be a really good experience. And, and it's stupid things that make things really good. And that's becoming more important. So I, I think the focus comes back to experience. That's probably native still. Okay. Matt? Completely agree with Jeff. I, I do think you have to... to Native is, is the universal answer. You can solve m more problems that way. And, uh, you know, we, I, I'm working on a, a cross-platform application now. It's basically the same application across the major operating systems. And we have a research, you know, a, a constant thread of where we're researching and experimenting, I think. I haven't quite found a good way to, to have the same exact, you know, a good experience um, with you know, some of the, you know, HTML5, whether it's PhoneGap, Cordova, uh, Xamarin, haven't quite found that yet. Okay. So. I promised you interactivity, but in order to give you interactivity, I had to ground you in sort of the humor and the background of some of these gentlemen here. So we have a few minutes. You can be interactive. You can ask questions. Or we, the panel, can ask you guys questions. I think you might want it the other way around. So raise your hand, shout it out. An opportunity, never to be had again. Yes, sir. How how do you what? How do you balance out the center of excellence? Yeah. So what's the makeup of a, a center in, of excellence? In most cases, the center of excellence is usually a CIO term, right? Everyone, if you go to that level, they'll always go, "We set up a center of excellence," and then your developers will be like. Okay, but who's over there, right? It's the, it's the architects, it's the thing. A lot of cases, center of excellence from prior to recent, right, where you have more of the cross-platform development, it was supposed to be an advisory role, right? It's the group you got involved to help the business figure out what they needed to do, set, help set the standards. It was facilitation. What has now become is a lot of times center of excellences have actually become a center of excellence for build, and that's just because those are the resources to build the native, right? And that's where the challenge becomes, right? We've always, we know there's a lot of pendulum swings in the enterprise, right? And I think we're really at that point again where the enterprise is trying to figure out how do you deliver cross-platform at, at, a, at a good cost point, right? If you're building, if your center of excellence right now is doing B2C, it's easy, right? You go, hey, I'm building native, right? Because you want that great experience. But when you're coming internally and going, hey, you know what, we do an account opening process, we do CRM, things like that, 
you go, okay, well, now we're going to build it, and we're going to build it for the desktop. We're going to build it for mobile. Okay, well, just mapping those two, oh, wait a sec. If I'm doing mobile, now I need iOS, Android, BlackBerry. Oh, wait, plus I have my desktop. Oh, wait, I have my, I have my developers, and they're building HTML5. That's where the challenge is right now because we've got a case where the center of excellence needs to get to that advisory role, right, so they can work through the problems. But we've staffed it in a lot of companies by uh, um, specific native developers for platforms. So overall, it needs to be that, that hybrid roles, right? In every organization, you have people that have development skills, right? But they can also go work with the business and architecture and everything. Most cases, all enterprises are silos, right? The purpose of a center of excellence is the attempt to break those silos. Uh, the execution of that is why the CEO, CIOs will always go, oh, absolutely, we have a center of excellence. Well, from their perspective, yes, they have a center of excellence. They get a PowerPoint that shows exactly what that center of excellence did. What you're seeing, though, is the opposite side. Is that center of excellence providing the proper services to the developer community, to the business community? and to the individual infrastructure technology groups, right? Engineering, architecture, security, they're all vested stakeholders in the process. But right now, just like you're seeing in, on the consumer side, native is, is winning. And that's actually hurting the tools that enterprise needs to build those things. Because let's be honest, a lot of times you deal with enterprise developers and the first thing they want to know is, okay, now where's the UI? Oh wait, it's a command line? Oh, okay, we're not doing this. <laughs> type things. So, and if you look at a lot of the tools for HTML5, they are command line, yeah. which actually hurts it for those types of developers. Other questions. Yeah, the question is what do what does this esteemed group of gentlemen feel the future is for devices? We have phones, tablets, desktops, laptops, whatever today, and in was it 50 years? So Okay. Because 50 or 30 okay. is going to make a difference yeah. to our answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, based <laughs> on the way we were performing last night, it's yeah, not, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to be around in 30 years. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so for so devices in 20-something years from now. Let's go 20 years. What are they going to look like? We'll start with the device guy. So this is why you put me right next to you. So I you did. Well, actually, through. I did and Chelsea did. But yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Well, it's pretty much ambiguous computing, right? It's the fact that right now when we have the conversation with customers, because BlackBerry has the QNX group that actually is focused on IoT, and that's not a new IoT, right? That's coming from M to M. Historically, we've got stuff in nuclear power plants and all the other stuff, satellites. So when it comes down to it, when I have discussions with developers, it comes down to, okay, do you know what an M MVC is? Okay, now from that view perspective, forget your display, right? So now you're going, okay, it's a series of sensors, right, that's collecting the information. So now if those sensors are collecting that information, it's being stored in the cloud, it's being analyzed, as we've talked about stuff before, it's data, right? It's not the devices. So it's the collection, the processing, and the results of it. Because do you really care about the device? We've got, how many people said how many devices they have? You really want a solution, and that's in your personal life as well as your business life. All right, I'm going to go to Matt to ask that question next. We'll end with Jeff because I want to challenge him with something. So go for it, Matt. And, and, and focus on printers too. Like, what what does a printer look like in 25 years? <laughs> I mean, are we 3D? Are we 3D making the paper while printing at the same time? Is that? I'm more confident saying that I think wearables and you know different power solutions. It, it, you know, there's there's some research that shows that human body actually gives off power, right? Mm -hmm. Could we power devices based on that? I, I don't know. I mean, that's – but wearables are definitely – you know, you're seeing the start of it right now. You can tell it's – it may be 10 years out. Will we get wearable printers? I don't think so. No? I don't think so. But so if we did, Mopria would be all over it, right? If we did, we would be. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Okay. Um. I mean, paper's been around for a long time. It's a mature industry, and uh, I think that you know it'll always be there. It just to what extent and when. And, okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right, Jeff, bring it home. All right. So, so I think what's what's going to be incredible. I mean, if you if you look at the the current research by 2025, so that's 10 years, computers will have the same intelligence as a human being. So you'll have a machine that's equally intelligent as, you know, a human. 
in 20 years, a machine will be 100 times more intelligent than a human. So in 20 years, we'll be in a world where machines are 100 times more intelligent than we are. More intelligent or capacity to no, be more intelligent? I'm like, well, uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Because it's about actually. synapses and interact connects, right? Yeah, yeah. The this is this is the singularity thing, and this is a thing that uh, you know. This, this what what's really interesting about predicting the future, and and they did this in uh, there was a book in the 1850s that predicted what the 1950s would look like, and uh, I can't remember the author now, but basically the author asked the crazy scientists of the day. It's incredible how accurate the the you know predictions were. None of them made sense in 1850 at all. So I. It's, you're in a world where machines will be able to understand and do things that we can't understand. So uh, the, now you can all go all dark on this and all kinds of things. Uh, but I think I, I, you know, it's, it's pulling on, on what you said a little bit. You end up with pervasive intelligence. So there's, there's intelligence that's being given to you kind of like in a completely different way. And, and the concept of UX and UI and device, I think, uh, looks looks very, very different. Uh, uh, I think it disappears almost, which uh, could be interesting. So, so Gartner actually just did their IT expo down in Florida, and they had a number of predictions. If you want to go look at it, they've put them all online. But one of them was that by, by 2025, uh, uh, about 45% of all humans will be reporting to an artificial intelligence in the workforce. You will be directed and guided, and your boss will actually be an artificial intelligence. And based on the developer survey, that may be an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, does, does, does anybody feel like they, does anyone feel like they're having that today? <laughs> Well, I'm actually surprised none of you talked about biohacking, though, or by putting devices into the body, or actually, I mean, you talked about powering them, but I'm surprised we didn't, well, maybe that's that, a... That's a brilliant question, by the way. We can go on this one. Yeah, yeah. we can keep riffing on this yeah, one. Yeah. Well, but I notice what time it is. We're, we're right up on 4.30, and we promise people to drink. But so any last, last question, burning question that people want to have answered before we, before we wrap? No? All right, in reverse order, Matt, Jeff, Steve, your closing comment. Sending folks off, first ever enterprise developer series, summation of what you think they should be walking away with from your perspective. If you have apps and, and they have a uh, need to print in Android, it, it's very simple. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the Mofria line because I think it's an important one. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you for coming. I think I. Uh, this is the, as, as Jake said, this is the first one of these uh, events that, that we're going to be doing. I think there's a massive opportunity for this community to help accelerate the reinvention of large enterprises and to make them develop really, really good software products. And that's really good for us because uh, it means that our skills have a bigger market to get applied. We have a bigger chance to, you know, get to money from all our different perspectives. So... Uh, carry on being engaged and please tell everyone else that you know uh, this would be interesting to take part in. So in a lot of cases we end up with maker spaces that get people together in the community, right? Hacker hackathons, things like that. From an enterprise perspective, if you think about it, there really isn't much, right? There isn't much where you can pull people together into an organization where that's where this organization comes in. Getting people from different uh, organizations, different companies, different viewpoints together to figure out, hey, what are our common challenges? So I do, same as that thing, go, let's see who else we can get bring into this conversation in the future and expand it. Why can't we have this three times bigger next time? And, and I'd just add one comment, and I'd like to thank uh, Jake and uh, Chelsea, actually, for putting this thing on. Jake? Sorry? <laughs> oh my wow. God. Wow. <laughs> wow. 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 I'm going to change uh -huh. what I'm about to say about you now. The, uh, you, but Jake said something very important uh, this morning, and, uh, and it's something that the Application Developers Alliance does very well. He said, how do you, how, how do you actually define success for something? Uh, is it the number of uh, people in the room, or is it the, the quality of the conversation? you know, as perceived by the people in the room. And what uh, the Application Developers Alliance has always done very well is made sure there's very high quality conversation. And I felt that through the presenters uh, 
that we had all day today. So I'd like to give uh, Jake and Chelsea credit and a, a big thank you for putting this on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving my panelists, Steve, Jeff, and Matt, a warm round of applause. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining. Visit appalliance.org to access resources and join a global network of developers.